Thank you. Well, good morning again. <laughs> so last Sunday we talked about um, Calvinism and debunking all of that. And when I originally looked at chapter 9 of Romans, I thought, man, you know, this is continued on. But we need to understand that the entirety of the scriptures written about Christ and him crucified and what he does for us, correct? So when I looked at chapter 9, I realized that it does not talk about uh, predestination or anything like that. That's not what the whole subject of chapter 9 is about. And if we use scripture for our agenda, then we're wrong. Scripture is for us to teach and to repeat to glorify Jesus Christ and him crucified. So chapter 9, if you look at it, Romans chapter 9, is actually about the sovereignty of God. That's it. The entire chapter is about his sovereignty and about, again, like I said, once you become the creator of the universe, then you can make the rules. But until then, it's, it's God's world and, and he's in control. So this morning we're going to get into chapter 9, and he uses some of uh, Moses' conversation out of Exodus and then also I have a scripture that Peter wrote that completely uh, will, will bring some things together. But if you're in chapter 9, it says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Now, the first part of this scripture, I tell you the truth. Some people try to twist that and say Paul is talking about election and predestination. That's not at all where this is going. Paul here reminds you again, the church of Rome, that's who he's writing to. In the church of Rome are Israelites, Jewish people, and Gentiles. Remember, all of the conversations one through six, Paul was trying to teach that you cannot get to heaven by the law. The law only shows us our sins. So he's trying to, if you will, destroy the ideology of the church, the Israelites, the Jews, and saying, listen, no, there's a new, there's a better way that is through Christ and him crucified. So what Paul's saying here is that his heart hurts for his countrymen, the Israelites. Remember, Paul says he's a Jew, he's an Israelite, he's a Pharisee, He's the most knowledgeable. He gives his pedigree throughout of his letters. And, and so again, he's going to listen to me. What this particular chapter is about is my heart hurting for the church. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. All that means is the physical beings of the Israelites. It does not mean sin here according to the flesh, but his countrymen according to the flesh. So it would be like me saying, my heart hurts for all of you Hoosiers. You are my countrymen according to the flesh because I was born in Indiana. That's all he's saying here. That does not mean anything else. But, it also helps me to understand a pastor's heart. My heart breaks. And we've said it before. We, we go to Home of Hope Teen Challenge down in Casa Grande. And I can tell you from some of the stories that we get after they leave that program and they wander away, my heart hurts for those ladies. That's why we love going down there and sharing to them the pure word of the gospel. They get a lot of people come in and teach them and they teach them religious things or, or their own agenda. It's my joy to give you the word of God because there's nothing else. There is no other place for the words of life. It hurts my heart to know that there are people that will sit under the sound of my voice and miss heaven. That hurts. That makes it hard sometimes to get up here and to preach through the word of God without screaming, 
get right, find God, <laughs> go to the foot of the cross. But a compassion, and, and Moses had that same compassion. Remember when he was up on the mountain? <laughs> and I love the two stories. There's two storylines there. There's one about Moses and there's one about Aaron. Moses goes up and he's talking to God, right? And the children of Israel are down there and they make a golden calf. Now, Aaron is the church. You want me to tell you what Aaron says? Well, I don't know what happened, Moses. I mean, I was just standing there. And all the children of Israel gave me gold. And I threw it in the fire and out came a calf. I mean, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> so when we make mistakes or when things go wrong, we're like, oh, I don't know how that happened. I was just worshiping something else and not you, God. I don't understand why you're mad. Moses comes down, and he says, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sins. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. This, to me, the next verse is by far the greatest pain recorded in prayer. Yet, now if you will not forgive their sin, no words to be spoken. If you cannot forgive my people's sin, Moses just stood there for a moment, and I can imagine him out on the mountain, and he's going back up there, and his heart is heavy because of the church <laughs> was not listening to God again. And he goes up there, and he wants to stand before God, and he says, listen, these people have sinned. And I can just imagine that weight that he carried up that mountain, and all of a sudden he's in front of a perfect God. He said, what can I say? What can I say to you? that will make a difference for my people. He gets very bold here. He says, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to him, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. This verse is the crutch or the cruxus of Romans 9. When we make a deal with God and demanding that God do something that is not within his will. We are challenging the sovereignty of God. Moses did it under duress and great burden for people that had sinned and had wandered from him. And he was so passionate about the Israelites and his position as their leader that he literally had no words. He says, you know what? If you're going to wipe out your name and the Israelites take me with you because I don't want to go through this. That's what I read in that dash right there. It's such a burden, such a heartfelt prayer. To me, it's one of the most tremendous but scariest prayers that you could ever pray because you're asking God to condemn you to hell with all the other people that were disobedient. That's a brave prayer. But Paul did the same thing. He says in the beginning of this, I wish that I could be thrown out on your account. So if God would condemn me to hell, but save all of you, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for that. Paul's doing the same thing. He's having the same prayer as Moses. But he gets back into it. He goes on to say, now therefore go, <clears throat> excuse me, lead these people to the place of which... I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sins. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they had, had, they had did with the calf and Aaron made. But Paul speaks part of this verse in this, but I've sort of completed it because you really need to see the whole picture. And it reminds me of when Paul told the Bereans, remember that when he told the Bereans something? 
they searched the scripture to know whether or not it's true. They went back into the word and said, okay, Paul, we understand what you're saying, but like you normally do, you just take a piece of the verse and, and you try to explain it to us. They went back and saw it in context and tried to understand it completely what Paul does. And that's what we need to do a lot of times in the teaching here in Romans. We need to go deeper into what Paul is saying. So Paul says, my heart is broken. I wish that I could be a curse for my brethren of the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the services, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, is over all the etern eternally blessed God. Amen. So, again, all Paul's saying is, listen to me. I wish that I would be a curse for those who are countrymen of me. Why? Because we are the chosen nation. Israelites are the chosen nation. And Paul says, I wish I could be a curse from them. And he goes on to explain why here in a minute, why he's doing this is how, again, what he tried to do in the first six chapters of Rome, he's still arguing with them. In, in first six chapters of Romans, he's going, listen, you're still not listening to me. Now they're challenging the sovereignty of God. If you look into what he's saying here, the Israelites in this church at Rome is going, okay, listen, we're the chosen. Over here, we're the Israelites. We've got the right to heaven. You nasty Gentiles over there. Israelites, we're, we're the chosen here. We're, we're the good people, right? But these knuckleheads are coming into church thinking they're going to get to heaven because of this stupid thing called faith. They are not listening to the law. Can you believe that? So that's what he's telling the church at Rome is telling him. If you look at this, they're saying, hey, no, 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 no. They can't get to heaven. They're not of Abraham. They're not of the seed of Abraham. They don't have the promise that through our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they're going to go to heaven. So, Paul, we got a problem with these people coming to church. And I know none of you have ever been to a church like that. So this is a unique problem to the church at Rome. But isn't it that way? We get very pharisaical and say, you know what? When, when God saved me, there's just no blood left. Nobody else can get saved. So when people start coming into church, we go, well, you can come to church, but sorry for you. Because you're not of the chosen like we are. And that's, that's the argument here. And Paul's going, no, wait a minute. I feel sorry for my countrymen who have all of this stuff, but they're missing the point. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Okay, now Paul's saying, listen, just because you're from the seed, you're not really Israel. Now wait, what? But we're of the seed of Abraham. Okay, you're of Israel, but you're not really of Israel. <laughs> and, you know, Paul's never confusing, so I'll try to get through this. So... Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. By flesh, they are the seed. Okay? Are you following me? <laughs> These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So listen, he's saying, okay, they're children of Abraham, but they're not children of God. They have the promise, but they're not going to get the promise. Why? Because they're trying to do it through the law and not through faith. And now he goes on to say, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. 
And not only this, but when Rebekah also have conceived, had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Now, he's talking about Jacob and Esau. Remember this story. And even in the womb, God says, I hate him, and I love Jacob. This is getting hairy, isn't it? <laughs> we'll get there. But why? Because God knew that Esau would give up his birthright. God knew that Esau was more interested in the flesh than he was in his inheritance. When you come to church and you become very pharisaical, very judgmental, and people have to look like a Christian rather than be a Christian, I'm pretty sure God's upset with you. I'm just saying. He hated the Pharisees, and that to me seems to be a pharisaical way of living. He's saying, listen to me, just because you look like an Israelite does not make you an Israelite. Just because you're of the seed does not give you the benefits because you are giving up your birthright. And that's why he hated Esau, because he foreknew the actions that he would take for a bowl of soup. We're more worried about filling this and satisfying my physical than we are worried about our eternal spiritual state. We're fleshly. And he says, just because you were born into Israelites doesn't make you an Israelite. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Challenging the sovereignty of God. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now, I'm going to rewind you real quick to that scripture that I read from Exodus. It actually goes through two chapters there, 9 and 10. And it starts out with the sin of the Israelites by Aaron and the golden calf while he was up on the mountain. This is all the way at the end. What he's quoting here is at the end of the next chapter. And God has had this long conversation with Moses about this one incident. And he now is going back to and answering Moses' statement of, blot me out also. You, as a human, have no right to dictate to God whom will receive salvation or not. That's what Moses was trying to do. He said, listen, if you're going to turn your back on him and send him to hell, send me too. Because you have no right to do this, God. They're your chosen seed. They are the Israelites. But none of them that died in the desert accepted Christ by faith. They wanted the fleshly desires. And they even said, put me back in prison where my belly was full. Even though I was being beaten daily, I would rather be there because my physical is being taken care of. They lost sight of God and his spiritual fulfilledness. And that's what he, the argument here is. is listen, God, you, you saved us. Remember, us over here, the good people, not you Gentiles. God, you cannot save them because they're not of the seed. Their arguing is not predestination or election here. It is the sovereignty of God in trying to control an almighty God. So y'all need to stop. Okay, listen. Yeah, very good. She apologized. So we're okay now. So, but that's what's going on here in chapter 9. We're trying to destroy church. We're trying to destroy pharisaical and understand that the grace of God reaches everybody. That's all chapter 9 is about. And he's using the argument, same thing that happened to the children of Israel way back here. And he says, they did not receive it because they did not receive it in 
faith. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? You cannot get to heaven without faith in the work that was accomplished here on the cross. There is no other way to heaven. I don't care where you were born, what lineage you think you have, it is garbage when you get to heaven if you're not covered in the blood of Christ. That's all chapter 9 is about. If you try to invent a new way to get to heaven, Jesus Christ him said, you are a thief and a robber. There is only one way. So as I looked at chapter 9, I'm like, wow, <laughs> let's talk about God. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor him who runs, but God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Again, when this scripture is grabbed and ripped out of the pages of the Bible, people try to use it as election and predestination. It's because they were not very Berean in their studies and go back and understand where Paul pulled this story from. So I did it for you. Exodus chapter 9. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, God talking to Pharaoh, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet, why am I doing this? Because you... Exalt yourself against my people, and you will not let them go. So God did not arbitrarily grab Pharaoh and say, I'm going to condemn you to show my purpose. No, I am hardening your heart because you have already hardened your heart, and now I am going to use your evil for my good. That's the sovereignty of God, not predestination. God will use evil push forward his purpose. Remember, Judas had a decision, right? Before he betrayed Christ. And he had remorse afterwards. But he was used because of the hardness of his heart to fulfill prophecy and the word of God. All things work together for those who are called in Christ Jesus, right? And for our good, our spiritual good. So what God was trying to use, a person that had hardened their own heart against him to show himself great in his children's eyes. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. If you read this story, and it goes on to say that he cursed and he cursed and he cursed, Christ was cursing everything in Egypt, right? And all of the cattle of the Egyptians died but none of the Israelites were touched. And then the next time he comes around, he says, I'm about ready to smoke everybody again. If there's an oxen in the field, I'm going to kill it. Guess what happened this time? There's some Egyptians that had faith. They ran outside and said, nope, Bessie, get in the barn. <laughs> God did it. He ain't lying. You know, and that's Faith. But Pharaoh said, how many times are you going to get smacked around with the same battle and not believe that God can answer that prayer? There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. But I'm backed up a minute here. He says, so then, it is not to him who wills nor him who runs. That's good news, folks. Salvation is not predicated upon your performance. Right? Why? Because of the sovereignty of God. When he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins, guess how many times? Once. Guess for how many? All. Okay? When he did that, your sins were forgiven, was not based upon your will, or how good you ran this race. It was based upon his sovereignty, his mercy, his greatness, his kindness, his love. Amen? That's what chapter 9 is all about. I mean, I'm telling you, when I started reading this and I reread it and I even read it this morning, I'm like, good Lord, how many years 
have I missed the glorious point of this chapter. Why? Because I listen to man's interpretation and not God's own word. When we get into God's own word and allow scripture to verify scripture, we see God's greatness, God's love, God's mercy, God's sovereignty, and it screams through the pages. And chapter 9 is no exception. This is not about predestination. This is nothing except God's sovereignty, and he has the power, and he has sent his son to die once for all. But it is your choice whether you accept or deny. But indeed, O oh man, O oh man, not old man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing that formed him say, formed, say to him, who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Again, folks, it's not going to predestination. It's going back to you are created, not the creator. Why are you challenging God's authority when you are created by him? And he's just trying to get a hold of these Israelites. Why? Not because he's trying to get them mad or thrown out of the church. He's trying to get every one of these people to come to the foot of the cross so that they know salvation, so that they can spend eternity with God in heaven. That is the argument for this word. That is the argument for the entire Bible. It is nothing else but to, to direct us to the foot of the cross and to understand God's love, God's grace, God's sovereignty. And we're having the same argument today that he had this many years ago in the church of Rome. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Remember, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he says, yes, in the house there are vessels of wood and clay. There are vessels of honor and dishonor. Pray that you become the former and not the latter. This is just circling back, folks. You have to get into the Word of God to see the complete picture. All Paul is doing in chapter 9 is smacking down Israelites who think they deserve to go to heaven just because they're children of Abraham. Again, I'll say, that's never happened in church. That just because I warmed his seat on Sunday, I deserve to be in heaven. Get away from me, I never knew you. Did not Jesus say that himself? About people that were casting demons out and healing? Get away from me, I never knew you. But we did it in your name. But you never came to me the way I prescribed. You tried to negotiate your way to heaven. So therefore, you'll be cast out into eternal darkness. That's what this chapter is about. God's sovereignty. It's not about man's made-up religion or man's agenda. This is about God and his grace. And even though you don't deserve it, you can still have it because he died once for all. What if... I'm going to put to you a question. God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power no known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. God tolerates because some of us are slower to learn than others and it takes us longer to accept the sovereignty of God. And he says, so I'm going to allow certain things to arise so that my power and my greatness can be shown for your salvation. That's all this verse means. And he shows that with the example of Pharaoh. Because on the first curse, Pharaoh didn't go, I give up. <laughs> Y'all go away. It took a lot more than that. Up until the time he lost his greatest love, his firstborn son. And he was still mad. And he still chased down the children of Israel. And God said, stop. I'm going to drown you. And he did. So God, in his long suffering, is to show his sovereignty, his greatness, his grace. 
and he will use vessels of destruction to do so. No one, whether or not you like the new president, no one gets into power without God's approval. No one is allowed to hold any place in office without God first saying yes, because this will fulfill my ultimate goal and will. You hear me? We allow the world to form our opinion about God wrongly. God is gracious. God is love. And he is very long-suffering. Why? So that no one would be lost. He gives us opportunity after opportunity. And when we manipulate the word of God to satisfy my own doctrines, step away from them. We have to preach the whole word of God and it is pointing to his sovereignty, his grace, his greatness, his love. That's what chapter 9 is all about. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Reluctantly, we have to accept you. Y'all got to take them in because the scripture tells us that they can come home too. Okay? That's what Paul's trying to do. His grace is for everybody. This is the final say in election. First Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to what? The foreknowledge of God. If you've ever had a question about predestination and election, the answer is right here. Everyone that is saved is because of what? The foreknowledge of God. Of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. You, I was going to say you can't argue with Scripture. You can. You're going to lose. But again, this is the defining verse. You have to compare Scripture to Scripture. Paul is making a singular argument in chapter 9 because the children of Israel are challenging the sovereignty of God. But you must compare the whole word of God together in order to get the perfect picture. That's why it tells us to study to show ourselves approved. Rightly dividing the word of God. And that does not mean making it into little chunks and separating it. Rightly dividing means rightly speaking or giving out the word of God. Amen? Okay. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who is not beloved. Again, where does the Israelites and the Jewish look to for all of their teachings is the Old Testament. So Paul says, fine, let me go into the Old Testament and I'll prove to you that your pharisaical stance is incorrect, starting with Hosea. Then he goes on, and it shall come to pass in the, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Again, he quotes another verse. And he also goes, Isaiah also cries out, Concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have become made like Gomorrah. Again, now he's going back to the children of Israel and saying, listen, most of you guys, because of lack of faith, are not going to make it to heaven. Just because you're an Israelite doesn't make you an Israelite. Just because you're a seed of Abraham doesn't make you get the promises of Abraham. Listen to me, folks. Just because you sat in a garage doesn't make you a Porsche. All right? No more sitting in church 
makes you a Christian or righteous before Christ. You must and have to come to the foot of the cross and accept the cross for what it was for, and that is the propitiation for your sins and my sins. That is the only way to heaven. And we can get lost and we can get sidetracked and start going, man, these crazy Israelites are even at it in the New Testament. I thought they had enough in the Old Testament. No. The Word of God is living and breathing and good for righteousness' sake of teaching, correction, admonishing, so that the man of God may be fully equipped to live a holy and righteous life. You hear me? So when you look at the Word of God and you go, Wow, that's a crazy story. And do not apply it to you spiritually. You have missed the mark of the word of God. And that's what he's trying to tell the children of Israel. Just because you're born of the seed doesn't make you get the promises. Prodigal son, right? He took himself out of the house. He said, give me all my inheritance right now. And he went and ran amok. He was still that man's son. There was never a point in his life that he was not that man's son, but he did not get the benefits because he took himself out of the house. And when you realize that you're on the wrong path and you get up out of the pig pen of the sin that you think is so great and you begin to dust yourself off, you start heading home you'll realize that the Father has always been waiting for you to come back and sit at the table. That's what the Word of God's trying to tell us. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Group come by faith, they get it. The ones that are trying to come by law and works, you're out. That's all chapter 9 is trying to tell us, folks. It's trying to tell us that the sovereignty of God reaches every human being. And we have to accept it by faith. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, as it were, by the works of the law, for they have stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Again, he talks right there in this verse. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. They thought just because they were of the bloodline, they deserved it. They did not come to him by faith in the prescription that Jesus Christ has us to come to him. Remember, the Bible also tells us that those who are, believe now are of the seed of Abraham. Though you were not born in the lineage, but by faith, since you came to Christ, you get the promises through the Abrahamic covenant because of faith. And that's all he's talking about here is God's sovereignty, God's greatness. So, does that make sense? <laughs> I know there was a lot of scripture and we really went through it. But honestly, as I studied chapter 9 more, I'm like, this has nothing to do with predestination. This is a bad argument if you're trying to, to grab and, and wrestle God's word to meet your ideology. That's dangerous. That's wrong. We have to take God's word for what it is. It is to glorify Jesus Christ and to bring us to his saving knowledge through the cross. Amen? That's good stuff, wasn't it? But the word of God, we need to get into the word of God and compare scripture with scripture. And you could see as we unfolded the scripture to back up what Paul was saying that, oh, wait a minute. What I've been taught all my life in church was man's agenda and not God's word. God's word is true, never failing, not contradictory. There was no contradiction in the verses that I brought to you. It was an explanation of scripture's 
by Scriptures. We must. There is no other way to come to Him but through faith. The one scripture that I wanted to end with, and I didn't flip my slides, was those verse 1, 2, and 3. When Paul said, and, and I'm asking you, church, I know we're small in numbers this morning, but we're mighty in God because it only takes two or three gathered in his name. But I want you to take back those first three verses in Romans chapter 9. And I want you, if you highlight your Bible, if you underlight in your Bible, please do so. And ask God to give you that heart for the lost. Paul says, I wish that I could be counted accursed for those people, for the Israelites. Why? Because Paul's heart hurt so bad because he knows how lost they are and how convinced they are that the law is the way to heaven. Have you ever met somebody like that? That is so convinced and so lost. Well, I went to a convention and I repeated after them. But did you have faith? Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a good person. Why would God throw me out? But did you have faith? But God said, where's that in his word? Have you met somebody like that? Paul has the pastor's heart that is just amazing to me. And I pray, God, give me that burden for my church, for the church that we have online. Give me that burden for people that I come in contact with. That, God, I would trade places with those people because I get crystal clear how awful hell will be. And there is no one that I have ever met that I would ask that curse upon. Break my heart, God, for what breaks yours. Break my heart for those who are misguided, for those who speak bad philosophy and try to get to heaven religiously without faith. My heart hurts. I know many people like that. And I just want to grab them and say, don't you understand? It's not about you. It's not about your performance. It's not about how people look, how people dress. It's about their faith in their heart. And unless you're teaching that true word of God, you are leading people astray. And that breaks my heart. Our heart needs to be broken now more than ever. There's lost people. There's people that are confused. I, and I'm telling you, the biggest impact of COVID is going to be the mental issues of it because we've allowed ourselves to be pushed away from everybody else. If you didn't know, CDC has canceled Thanksgiving. What? Who gives you the right who gives you the right to separate us by fear? My Bible tells me that <laughs> there's no fear in perfect love. And I need you. I need you in order to become strong spiritually. We need each other. Because, man, when you are alone, <laughs> this really starts messing with you. And unless we stay in the Word of God, pray together, fellowship together, we're in trouble. Our hearts should be broken for the misery, not of the United States. The whole world's gone crazy. I mean, it's gone crazy. Why? Because we have shoved God out of everything. Because the church has wrongly divided the Word of God and made it about their philosophy and not about his grace. Shame on us, church. This is a call to you who know him to get on your faces and beg God for forgiveness. Read Daniel chapter 9. Pray that for our country. Nehemiah chapter 1. Pray for that for our country. I'll say it again. Nehemiah chapter 1. Daniel chapter 9. Both those men, great men of God, had the greatest revival prayers that you'll ever find in the Bible. And you need to be on your knees 
when you're reading those two chapters, Nehemiah chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 9. And it, listen to me, it took one man, one man got before his face and begged for forgiveness of his sins and the sins of his people, and God heard and God began to move. Nehemiah chapter 1, Daniel chapter 9. Powerful prayers that we need to more than ever have the heart of Paul like he did here in chapter 9, the first few verses. I wish, I wish that God would take my one soul and save thousands. But God also listens to me. Shut up. <laughs> you cannot dictate me, but you can pray for them and he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Amen? Folks, this is not, this is not a, a chapter of agenda. This is a chapter of calling Christians to prayer. Calling Christians to pray correctly. There's a part of the Bible that tells us, I will pray in the Spirit, but I will pray with understanding. So many times we have our agenda and we want to pray a certain way and we want to get a certain feeling or we want something to happen to us. You need to ask for wisdom. You need to ask for grace and you need to ask for understanding when it comes to the Word of God and in your prayers. God have mercy on me and my fathers, my people and the world as a whole. Please shake us to the core to where we find you by faith. Amen? Well, I'm not going to have an altar call this morning. I'm just going to ask you to close in prayer with me that God will break your heart and give you a heart like Paul's, like Moses, and that we truly understand that the Word of God is not about my agenda, not about your agenda, but about His agenda, which is saving us through the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do... Thank you. It was quite a journey this week in your word. And, and I love the, not the revelation, Lord, because this isn't something novel to me. I just love that you opened my eyes to see what this chapter was truly about. And Lord, it, it was, it's about you, your greatness, your grace, your love, your sovereignty, that you are the creator, that you are in control. Lord, and that you show mercy to who you wish to show mercy. But by your foreknowledge, God, you understood that each one of us here today would accept you as your, our Lord and Savior. And we're grateful, God, that our hearts weren't hardened by our own actions, Lord. And if there's anyone that hears me right now in this room, online, the ones that will hear us later this week, Lord, please, please, I beg, Lord, that they will quit hardening their hearts and deafening their ears to your word, to the wooing of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray as deeply as I can, Lord, like Moses just hurt so bad. So bad, Lord, because he knew your greatness. And Lord, in those scriptures, it says that you talk to him face to face as a friend would talk to a friend. God, oh, what an amazing relationship. That you're willing to be that for us, Lord. And as Paul's heart hurt for his countrymen because of their arrogance and and what they thought would get them to heaven, Lord. May our heart break for those who are not listening to the whole word of God, who are not listening to the cross and the blood and, and what it stands for, that we can come freely. It's not my performance. It's not my maintaining it, Lord. It is me living freely purged in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, just listening and letting you guide me letting your word penetrate my heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, break our hearts. Please show kindness and mercy upon our world. We desperately need you, God. May we stay in your word. May you make me a man of your word, Lord, and never stray. Let me stay in your word so that I may teach others so that we can be a soul-winning church. And I beg and ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Worship team, come forward.
Thank you. Have a good week.